Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on this live session. Before we begin, please check in on today's event. The check in link is on the screen, which is aka.ms slash reactor check in. The event ID is 15034. Or you can scan the QR code from your phone and it will take you directly to the check in page. Remember, by checking in, you get access to all the resources and learning paths after the event. I have also added the check in information in the chats. My name is Ravneet and I'm the program manager at Reactor London. You can find all our upcoming events on the Microsoft Reactor website or our meetup groups. All the links to our platforms will be displayed on the screen before the end of the session. Before we get into the session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences and be kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Today's episode is on digital accessibility with Karen. Karen is the owner of Carlin Communications. She has been providing a leadership role for over 20 years in the field of digital accessibility. Please note that this session will be recorded and will be available to view in the next 48 hours on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. I will be in the background if you need me, and I would now like to hand over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Karen McCall. I do have a visual disability so that I, I do use the adaptive technology, primarily a screen reader, even though I do have what's called functional vision. I can just move around a computer faster using a screen reader. Although I do use screen magnification for some tasks, I use voice recognition. I'm someone who believes in a tool for a task rather than a tool for a disability. So the tool that I'm going to be using to access digital content or environments will depend on the environment that I'm in. I have written several books on how to create accessible content, a lot of them related to accessible PDF and Office documents. I am a Microsoft Office MVP for Office Apps and Services and, and a Microsoft Accessibility MVP. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about some of the disabilities, some of the people that are going to be accessing content that we all create. Because I want everyone to understand that universal design, creating something to be accessible to the broadest range of people, especially when we talk about vision loss or people with learning or cognitive disabilities, isn't one person that we're dealing with. We talk about using people who are blind as a baseline for making things accessible because if we can think of someone who is not able to use a monitor or a mouse, we will get a lot of the accessibility built into things and we can then start adding things like color contrast or fonts for um, various disabilities. Example, there's a dyslexic font. So if we create something to be accessible, someone who requires or wants to use the dyslexic font can easily swap out that font for the one that we've used. So scalability and flexibility are involved with making things more accessible, especially in a digital environment. This slide imagines what it's like if you have glaucoma. So someone with glaucoma will have what we may call tunnel vision. They only have the central field of vision. So a lot of the peripheral, peripheral information is not available to them. So we think, OK, so we understand um, glaucoma. Then we look at macular degeneration and the effects of macular degeneration are the exact opposite. Someone loses their central field of vision, but has really good peripheral vision. So we begin to think of how we're going to make things accessible to meet the needs of people who have glaucoma um, or macular degeneration. 
if we then add diabetic retinopathy, we see that many parts of the visual field are missing. This is um, how we would imagine someone with diabetic retinopathy would see print and an advanced stage of diabetic retinopathy. As it progresses, more and more of the digital field or the visual field rather is lost until they may eventually lose uh, all of their vision. So if we now think of the technology that people will be using, we have a lot of technology. We have screen readers that were designed for people who are blind. We have text-to-speech tools that were designed for people with learning cognitive or print disabilities and is sometimes used by people who are using screen magnification. We have screen magnification software, which can be used on its own. Generally, when someone is looking at a screen with five times magnification, we start moving them from text to speech, which supports basically the document, to a screen reader, which supports the entire user interface. Because as you can imagine, 5, 10, 15, 20 times magnification, you're only getting one or two characters on the screen. So using things uh, like word prediction, are going to uh, not going to be available and your reading is going to be slowed down. You also have voice recognition and a lot of people will use screen readers with voice recognition so that they can dictate into uh, a document or they can move around the user interface and the screen reader will tell them where they are to validate that they did the right thing and to read the text back as it's typed. We have touch screens that are also accessible on some of the uh, iOS or not, not iOS uh, mobile devices. We have haptic feedback. I have an Apple Watch and I have the haptic feedback turned on so that when I don't want the audio, I still have the haptic feedback. We have haptic mice so that as we move across a map, for example, we'll feel the different um, movements based on whether we're over water or mountains or in a large town or a small town. We can combine that with sound so that we know when we are near a lake shore or we are near a larger town or smaller town or even a train station on a map. We also, um, as I mentioned, need to start looking at uh, tools for task rather than tools for disability. So I, I would imagine everybody might be able to use the haptic tools where you move them over a map and you can actually sense and hear what's going on on the map. We've always been here. There are a lot of inventions throughout history that have been designed to help those of us with disabilities that help everybody. For example, the typewriter was invented in Italy by someone who wanted a friend of his who was blind to be able to write letters. That has evolved to the keyboard that we use on our computers. When Edison was getting the patent for the phonograph, one of the things that is in the patent application was that the phonograph would be useful for people who are blind because you could put books and, and newspapers and things on one of the cylinders and then people who were blind would be able to have access to printed material. We all know about Alexander Graham Bell, uh, whose homestead is actually less than 15 minutes away from me here in Ontario, Canada, who invented the telephone because um, his wife was uh, hard of hearing and he wanted a way for her to communicate. Email was created by someone whose wife was deaf and again saw a need for his wife to communicate and invented email. With December the 3rd being International Day of People with Disabilities, I also discovered that the electric toothbrush was originally designed because someone had a family member or a friend who had mobility issues and couldn't use a standard toothbrush and the electric toothbrush was invented. So a lot of the things that are going to help those of us with disabilities help everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey in terms of accessing print. 
on the screen, I have an image and it's uh, in the collage of images, it's in the upper left. It's the very first talking book that I had back in, it wasn't that long ago, it may seem like it when I give the year, but uh, it was in the 1970s. And this was the talking book that I had. You could basically use it as a boat anchor. There were two parts to the talking book. There was this big, heavy wooden cabinet that would be a boat anchor on its own. But then there were these huge, heavy metal cylinders that sat on top of it. And um, you, you would really have to have two or three sets of luggage as well as this if you wanted to call this anything uh, related to portability. The next thing that I had as a talking book were talking books on records. And these were 33 and a third records. And again, just trying to carry those around, being able to travel and read what I wanted to read when I wanted to read it was very difficult. We moved to CDs and that was a little bit easier, although I then had one bag of CDs because I had to figure out when I was traveling, okay, what books might I want to read? Uh, I then had a really cool uh, device called the Roadrunner and it allowed me to have uh, text as well as audio files on it. And I went to the Project Gutenberg website, which is a website just full of all uncopyrighted uh, books, the classics and um, science fiction, every genre, historical books. And I downloaded, uh, I started at the A's and I went through almost every author whose last name was A. And I was reading so much because I was suddenly free. This fit in my pocket. I, I could put, you know, 30, 40 books on it. And I was reading so much book in book, so many books rather, in the robotic voice of the Roadrunner that after a couple of weeks I was working at a conference and it took me a half an hour to recognize people's voices because they didn't sound robotic and I'd had so much robotic sounding um, uh, text in my ears that listening to human voices seemed foreign to me and, it, and I was surprised that it took me a while to get used to human sounding voices again. I now have the Victor Reader Stream which has been on the market now for about 20 years and it will hold a 32 gigabyte SD card. So I carry around my entire 900 and some odd book Audible library in a little plastic container with about 15 SD cards. So it will, not only will the Victor Reader Stream fit in my pocket, but 900 books will fit in my pocket. So it has given me a lot of freedom to read what I want when I want to read it. I don't have to think about where am I going? How long am I going to be away? Uh, how many uh, books will I need to take or how many can I, I carry? And I, I will say that this is an, a device that can help everybody. A lot of people don't know that it exists. It would be similar to downloading books onto a mobile device, except I find this uh, to be a lot more flexible because I don't have to be connected to the internet in order to use it. I just have to have the books on, on the SD card. I'm going to switch and start talking about the different categories of accessibility now. And the first one I want to talk about is transportation. I never know whether to talk about transportation, education, or employment first, because without access to transportation, I don't have access to employment and I don't have access to education, and neither do most people with disabilities. You can have the most inclusively designed brick and mortar school, but if we can't get there, then we don't have access to it to education. One of the things with COVID is that a lot of education moved online, which revealed a lot of digital barriers. There isn't a lot of content in learning management systems that is accessible. There are people, and I know this affects people with and without disabilities, but there are students with disabilities who don't have the computers with all of their technology on it at home. 
there are students who live in areas where you still have dial up. And one of those areas is less than an hour and a half away from me here in Southern Ontario, Canada. So the kind of myth that everybody is connected and we just shift to digital learning really revealed a lot of the digital barriers. And we did have a four to five month between the first wave of the pandemic and the second wave of the pandemic where we could have developed strategies. And those of us who are disability rights advocates were on any venue that would listen to us trying to get uh, governments and academic institutions to start, you know, moving toward digital, uh, digitally accessible education. And that time was, uh, I feel, wasted. A lot of it was because the, the focus was on making sure everybody stayed at home and, and we dealt with the pandemic itself. But there were other things in the pandemic that were taken care of. And those of us with disabilities accessing information, uh, sorry, education and employment seem to be at the bottom of the list. And we're still waiting for a lot of that content to be made accessible. Now that we're coming out of the pandemic to some extent, there isn't a focus on ensuring that digital content and learning management systems are, are accessible. So, in terms of transportation, there are a lot of barriers that we face. Buying tickets from a kiosk. I was in Linz, Austria, and was surprised that one of the kiosks on the corner where you buy your tickets had a button that you could press for audio feedback as you bought your tickets. We don't have that here, even in, in Toronto. If you want to buy a ticket, you have to find somebody who's in one of the ticket booths. And because they have the kiosks to buy tickets, they're reducing the number of people. So there are very few places where we can buy tickets to get on the public transportation. Uh, finding a stop, uh, whether it's a bus stop or a train stop. I'm so used to having the stops read out thanks to David Lepofsky, who's a disability rights advocate and took the case all the way to the Supreme Court in Canada, that when I was visiting Cardiff, Wales, and I'm on the train and none of the stops were read out, I had no idea where I was um, or when to get off the train because I was looking for a specific stop. Uh, fortunately, I was traveling with someone who could see the signs, but if I were on that train, by myself, which I often do, I often travel by myself. Um, I wouldn't have known when to get off the train. There was no conductor or a train person that I could ask. Um, so being able to know when you're supposed to get off the train. One of the other things that uh, came as a result of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act is that now when the bus door opens at a stop, the bus route and where it's going is announced. So I no longer have to ask the bus driver, um, is this the bus that I want? Because it's automatically read out. And they may seem like small things, but they are things that lead to um, improved confidence and self-esteem, not having to ask everybody for every piece of information, but the information is just there. Um, Another problem that I have, um, I don't have enough vision to read the small seat numbers. So when I get on an airplane or when I get on a commuter train, uh, sorry, uh, our VIA train, uh, which is our national train, I have to ask someone to help me find my seat. So being able to have that available to me, either through, through an app or in some other way would be really helpful. Kiosks, as I mentioned, where you buy things um, on, the, on the trains. The image on this slide is one, it's a recent one and it's a really good idea. So for audible signals as you're traveling, for audible signals, there is a way that you can tap a button if you need more time to cross the road. Unfortunately, 
there is no way to know that that button is there because the button is surrounded by images. And unless you can see those images, you don't know that you can tap this button to get more time. It, this kind of innovation is useful. Um, I used to live in a community that was a little bit bigger than where I am now, and they put uh, audible signals across five lanes of an intersection, and you only had 27 seconds to cross that intersection. The intersection was near a lot of uh, apartments where seniors lived. It, one of the corners had a major grocery store. So this was just an accident waiting for it to happen because anybody who had a grocery cart or was using a walker or a cane would not be able to get across five uh, lanes of traffic in 27 minutes. So a really good innovative idea, but a little more thought into how are people who can't see this going to be able to activate it. I was at a conference and it was a huge conference and the conference venue itself was oh, six or eight buildings and each building had six or eight sections and it would have been really nice uh, because there was an app for uh, the, the convention center. It would have been really nice if I'd been able to tap on my phone you know, here's my next session, and it would tell me, you know, when you go, when you exit this room, turn right, walk this many paces, or to even tell me when I had walked past the room, just directions on how to get there. Uh, being someone who's not familiar with a place like a convention center, it takes more time, probably twice as much time, to be able to find the room that you want to go into. Here we have a um, entertainment center called the Sanderson Center, and they've implemented something called Blind Square. The University of Guelph has also implemented it so that someone who has the Blind Square app can enter that building and be able to navigate it so that as you're going past things, they're identified to you and you can find a route to where you need to go. So simple things that we already have the technology to do, we just haven't used the technology in an innovative manner. One of the things that I find very interesting um, is that I thought with all we knew about accessibility, that when hotel rooms switched from the thermostats that were down near the floor, and went to ones that were um, digital displays on the wall that we would build accessibility in. Not so much. Um, where I used to have to get down on my hands and knees and get my magnifying glass out to try and figure out what the dials were on the thermostat. And in a lot of cases, I, I would have to get too close to the actual buttons and dials and I, it was just out of reach um, without either bumping my head or losing what vision I, I already have. The problem now is that the digital displays don't have a good enough contrast. And if I turn the light on my magnifying glass, it washes out the entire digital display. The other problem is that a lot of the digital displays for thermostats aren't at a height for people who use wheelchairs. So we have this innovation in hotels where we have these digital displays, but the digital displays aren't accessible. Again, a little bit more thought about inclusion and making sure that someone with a disability is going to be able to access the digital display. One of the other issues with um, hotels and travel is that up until a few years ago, when you requested an accessible room, that meant just a room on the first floor. If someone asked for a wheelchair accessible room, they were told, yes, we have that. Um, we And you had to ask more questions. And you had to learn how to ask more questions and what questions to ask. Because if you said, can I put a wheelchair in the shower? all of a sudden they had no accessible rooms, that their definition of an accessible room was a room on the first floor. 
one of the very first lawsuits came from the UK and it was related to the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. And it said that because the home office of hotels, a, a hotel chain was in the United States, that any of the satellite hotels in other countries would be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I notice now that here, even in Canada, if you go to a hotel site, you have the option to request an accessible room and they list what the amenities are in that accessible room, that you can use a wheelchair at the desk, that you can wheel into the shower. Um, I was in a hotel in, in Banff and it was supposed to be their accessible room and there was one step up into the bathroom. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. One of the other problems in terms of digital accessibility that needs um, a little bit more thought are the mobile devices that are now being used at airports and in school cafeterias to order things at restaurants and fast food outlets. They aren't accessible. Um, I'm not sure what operating system they're using. I know that you could create something to be accessible if you were using an iPad or a Google, I don't know what the name of the Google uh, uh, thing is because I use iOS devices, but they have accessibility built in. So the first problem is that, that the devices need to be able to use the technology. The second part of the barrier is that the menus need to be made accessible. So a little bit of alt text on the images that includes a description and maybe the price. So what I end up having to do is to get in line um, and I'm in line with people who have already ordered. I get up to the place where you're supposed to pay money and I have to say, um, excuse me, I can't use the, um, the mobile device to order. And I have to think quick, what do I feel like? You know, like, do you have a roast beef sandwich? Do you have a ham and cheese sandwich? Do you have a breakfast sandwich? So I have no access to the entire menu because I don't want to um, take the time from the people who are behind me who are now already frustrated because <sighs> she's ordering. Um, so I, I end up eating things that I, I just think, what would this place have? that would be on their menu instead of being able to look at the menu and maybe spend more money there um, and being independent and ordering food on my own. When we look at education, I'm looking at how we are still focusing on accommodating for those of us with disabilities rather than including us in especially in the digital environments. If we look at brick and mortar uh, schools, a lot of them have been made accessible. Some of them are older. Um, so we can take a look at what can be um, renovated or retrofitted. But when it comes to digital environments, there shouldn't be the need for as much accommodation. The accommodation should simply be to maybe have more time for assignments and more time for tests. Because when you use adaptive technology, um, it, it does take more time. It doesn't matter how fast you're reading, it does take more time to get through things because things like screen readers work in a linear fashion, top to bottom, left to right um, for English content. So the learning management systems have focused on accessibility for students, but not necessarily accessibility for teachers, because of course there are no teachers with disabilities. And that was one of the things that I faced in earning my Bachelor of Education in my Ontario Teacher Certificate. I attended a faculty of education that was close to the Detroit um, Windsor border. Well, University of Windsor. And my grade seven students in 1983 had weapons. I broke up fist fights in grade 10 um, in a vocational school. So I practiced 
taught and passed all of the hurdles and all of the things that any other teacher would have to pass. And yet when I went for job interviews, I was told that if I were in a wheelchair, they might be able to take a chance on me. But since my disability was vision, how was I going to control students? The other thing that I got a lot was, how am I going to tell parents that a blind person is teaching their children? And my response was, well, how do you tell someone that someone who's blonde or a redhead or has brown eyes or blue eyes or is tall or is short is teaching their children? Um, so there aren't a lot of supports for teachers with disabilities. There isn't a lot of um, inclusion. And that's one of the things that we need as people with disabilities. We need role models. We need to see ourselves in positions of teacher and architect and multimedia specialist. Any profession, any career that we choose that we um, are capable of doing. And it's up to us to try and fail or try and succeed. But we need to see role models of those of us with disabilities. And coming back to the being accommodated for, one of the accommodations that is still persistent is trying to get curriculum in a format that's accessible. One of the things that I would hear is that no one with a student will be taking my course to which I, I would bow my head and in, in my most serious voice would say, I'm just so sorry. And I'd get this puzzled look and I would say, I'm just so sorry that your content is so boring that not even those of us with disabilities would want to take your course. The other um, thing that I would have commented on was that, you know, well, what if someone who's blind wants to take a brain surgery course? And I would say, OK, so we're dealing with fear. Let's take all of the fear. Let's say that someone who's totally blind is deaf and uh, quadriplegic wants to take a, a brain surgery course. And you know, you get this mortified look on somebody's face. And I said, it may be a, a requisite course. It doesn't mean that your curriculum can't be accessible. They may never perform brain surgery, but because they look at the information in a different way, they may develop tools to make brain surgery easier. They may grasp a different understanding of how the brain works or how surgery works. You Again, going back to you can't say that no one with a disability is going to be in any course, in any uh, department, in any curriculum. Um, one of the other things that I, I would do when I was teaching instructional design, because the other barrier is that if something isn't in an accessible format, we're told, well, you know, go down to disability services because that's what they're there for. So I would put up white text on a white background and I would say, you know, here's the information that we just covered. You're going to have a quiz on it at the end of uh, at the end of, uh, of lunch. And then they would kind of, uh, I'd hear whispering and some brave person would say, Karen, there's nothing on the screen. And I would turn up the volume on my screen reader and it would read it perfectly. And I would turn the tables. It's like, well, I don't have a problem with this. If you have a problem accessing this, go down to disability services and they'll make it accessible. A lot of times it is the small things that will make digital content accessible. A lot of times it's just learning how to use tools like Microsoft Office the way that they were meant to be used instead of flinging things at, at a page or on a slide or in an email or on a spreadsheet. Part of accessible design is the word design. It's not called accessible fling. We're not just flinging things at a page. It's accessible design. We have to go back and teach people how to design digital content, whether it's architecture or multimedia or programming or documents. We need to start when 
kids first put their hands on a keyboard and teach them that what they create is inclusive. It's not identified as inclusive. This is just how you create things. Right now, we are graduating people who cannot compete in a global economy because they don't have that accessibility and inclusion component. Countries like the UK and the United States, Australia, New Zealand, European Union, Canada, all have laws around um, inclusion, around discrimination of people with disabilities. In Canada, we have provincial laws that talk about um, the right to education, the right to learn, the right to employment. And yet if we're not creating those environments, if we're not creating the software that's inclusive, the tools that are inclusive, and when people hire us, we are not able to, to do that, then we're unemployable. There are companies here in Ontario that before they will hire you or even give you an interview, if creating accessible content, no matter what it is, is part of the job description, you have to send in a portfolio of things that you have created so that they can be evaluated. So as we're graduating people that cannot compete in a global market in the terms of digital accessibility, we're also finding that companies are now not willing to train people on how to make things accessible because they think that should be part of the basic skill set that someone has. I started doing conference presentations and talking about the need to create a global inclusive education standard based on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities back in 2009. And as of 2015, one of the big words in education is inclusion. Had nothing to do with, with my presentations or that, but we're talking about inclusive education, and yet nobody really knows what inclusive education is. My component of the educa inclusive education standard is the component that deals with people with disabilities and accessible digital content. There are other components that that deal with people from different countries with different languages and um, all of that, because we do need to have a baseline when everybody talks about inclusive education, we all need to have an understanding of exactly what that is and what that means. I did talk about uh, learning management systems and I, need to talk about formats because one of the things that I'm often asked is, well, what's the best format for you? Well, the best format for me or any other person with a disability is the format that is accessible. We can make PDF accessible. We can make to some extent EPUB accessible. We can make HTML. We can make Word documents. If we make a Word document accessible, we can easily save it or export it out to accessible PDF, accessible EPUB, HTML, to Braille using the Duxbury Braille translation software. And if we use styles correctly, we can have someone who's using screen magnification or who can't see the font that we're using in our document um, swap out the style set that's in our document for one that they can see. We have the tools to do this. One of the other trends is for people without disabilities telling us what the best format for us is. You will hear people in their respective corners talking about, um, well, PDF is the best for you. Um, EPUB is the best for you. HTML is the best for you. Those are the three that are have been having these ongoing skirmishes now for about six or eight years. And I come back to just make it accessible. Whatever format you choose to publish in as the document author or the publisher, just make it accessible. We have the tools to do it, and yet we're still talking about, well, what's the best format? The best format is an accessible format. When we look at employment, one of the things that appears on a lot of the 
job descriptions is that we are an equal opportunity employer. And yet people put that on the job description and don't really understand what that means. It means that the software that you use is accessible. The interview site is accessible. I don't have to ask whether the interview site is accessible. It just is. My workplace is accessible. I can get there if I'm using a wheelchair or if I'm using a white cane or a guide dog or I have um, a visual disability. I spent so many job interviews not talking about the skills that I bring to the table, but answering questions like, how did you get here? Well, I, I took the bus, like on your own? Didn't you come with somebody? Um, how are you going to get here to work? Well, the same way I got here for the interview. Um, is your screen reader compatible with our software? I, I don't know. Well, what does your screen reader do? Uh, I ended up answering more questions about my disability and my use of my technology than I did saying what I could bring to the job and what my career goals were. It's one of the reasons I started my own business. I don't have to answer those questions anymore. My workplace is completely accessible and I really don't face a lot of accessibility barriers unless I go into someone else's digital environment um, working on projects for them. When we talk about community, I'm going to go back to COVID and the pandemic. Online shopping was a nightmare. I could only order things that you would find in a convenience store, uh, the store around the corner. And of course, those are higher priced and a lot of them are junk food. I couldn't order anything that I would normally get at a grocery store because for those items, you had to do pickup only. Public transportation in my community as a more rural community was suspended and even if I could get on public transportation the first uh, store that was doing uh, pickup was 45 minutes away from me so for the first little while I had to depend on online shopping the other problem was uh, that I would put an order in on Monday and I would be told it would be four weeks before my order could be filled so what am I supposed to eat in the meantime? Another barrier was that the online shopping websites themselves were not accessible. Trying to pick items from a for a grocery cart using a screen reader and making sure that I got the right thing that I wanted. And then when I filled out my order to be delivered, I had absolutely no communication with the store and if the person that they had hired couldn't find the item in the store, they just substituted something else. So it was kind of like Christmas. Every time I got an online shopping delivery from the grocery store, I never knew what I was going to get, whether it was something that I, I could eat that I would want to eat, uh, or whether it was something on my list. Um, fortunately, my, um, my neighbors uh, asked me if, uh, I wanted to go grocery shopping with them. We all masked and hand sanitized. We all got double vaccinated at the same time. So, um, so that helped a lot. But again, it shows a gap in the digital accessibility and why we need to rethink the future. One of the things that I saw in terms of uh, shopping and just generally navigating was in the Zara store in New York City. Now, normally these types of computerized art are in museums, which is fine because then we don't have to deal with them. But this was a computerized store window that had sounds of waves and colored waves going all over the windows. And there were three or four large windows in the store. And I could just imagine having some vision and first of all being inundated with the sound of waves when I don't expect waves on a sidewalk in downtown New York which is where this store was and then having all of that visual confusion in the periphery of my vision 
and not knowing whether someone was going to um, to come up on that side of me and walk in front of me because as someone with a visual disability and I, I do use a, a white cane um, I'm always aware of what's around me so that I'm not bumping into anything. And all of a sudden having this art exhibit that just overpowers my senses as I'm walking past the store creates an accessibility barrier. And it's an accessibility barrier almost on the same level as the entire glass walls that have no markings on them and I end up um, walking into them. Um, I mentioned that I do use a white cane and I started using that after 9-11. The month after 9-11, I had to go down to a conference in um, Minnesota and I was going through customs at uh, Toronto Airport and I happened to see a person with a German Shepherd and nobody was letting them in line. So as I got up beside him, I said, go ahead. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you're, you've got the guide dog. Nobody's letting you in line to, you know, go ahead of me. Well, it turned out he was an RCMP guy with a sniffer dog and they went through my luggage because of course that was a suspicious activity. Um, as I went through the airport getting to my gate, I have to stop and take a look at the signs to figure out what the gate numbers are and that because they're just a little bit too high, even though they're big, I can't always make out what they are. Well, every time I stopped, someone would come over and go through my luggage getting pre-boarding. Um, I didn't look like anyone who needed pre-boarding, so they'd go through my luggage again. And I thought, you know what? I really don't care if you go through my luggage, but while you're attending to my luggage, um, you're not looking for people who might be suspicious. At one point I had called the airport and I said, um, uh, this was after the, I think it was the, the shoe incident in Detroit. I said, uh, you know, like, I'm, I have a white cane and I'm going to be traveling. And the person at the other end said, well, we're going to take that away from you um, and we'll guide you through the airport. And when you get off the plane at your destination, we'll give you your white cane back again. I was like, I know you people. I'm going to miss my plane. You're going to lose track of me. I don't have my white cane. I'm not going to be able to get around any place. Um, so no, you you can't take my my white cane. And as it turns out, when I got there, no one tried to take away my my white cane. But it was just a silly solution to a a reactive problem. All of this is to say that the digital barriers that those of us with disabilities encounter on a daily basis are intentional. At one point, we talked about an, as a community, a community of people with disabilities, we talked about these barriers being unintentional because we wanted to give people time. We didn't want to um, aggressively go after them. And so we just said, like, hey, we know these are unintentional barriers. Uh, maybe you'd want to fix them. After the pandemic or in the midst of the pandemic, I, I refuse to use that term anymore. We who created the technology intentionally created these barriers by not considering those of us with disabilities. I was listening to a disability rights advocate on the radio this morning talking about people in Nova Scotia, people with disabilities, not having appropriate housing. And she said that she felt like a throwaway person. And I, I, that really struck me because when we look at digital accessibility and not consciously building accessibility into everything that we create in terms of technology, technology that we created um, based on ones and zeros at its very core based on ones and zeros. So we are unintentionally creating, or sorry, we are intentionally creating barriers. And those of us with disabilities deserve to be at the table we deserve to be equal participants in the design process. When we talk about uh, this saying that came out of 2015, nothing about us without us, I've also shortened that down to nothing without us because saying that nothing about us 
gives people the open door to say, well, you know, mobile devices, um, they're not really about you. Uh, so we can do what we want. Uh, software, hardware, um, anything that is digital, um, it doesn't really have to do with you. So we don't have to talk to you about it. Um, you, you don't need to be at the table to talk about this. It's, it's another way of excluding those of us with disabilities. We need to start focusing on inclusive design. And, and here are two examples. I can't buy a digital fridge because I can't use the digital part of the fridge. It doesn't have a screen reader or text to speech tool or screen magnification built in. So as these types of appliances like fridges and stoves replace the ones that I can use with knobs and buttons, I'm not going to be able to access any of that. And I need to because it's there. It can be made accessible. And we need to start building that into everything that we do. I had this Cuisinart coffee maker that I loved because it was a grind and brew. I could grind the coffee, it would brew the coffee. Fresh, fresh coffee. But the digital display was to the right of the um, head that, that you uh, put the coffee filter in. And I could not get my magnifier close enough to that display to change it. In the whole two years that I had that coffee maker, without uh, either losing the vision in my left eye or severely uh, bumping my head. And again, when I turned the light on to see what was on the screen, it just washed out the entire screen. So for two years, I had whatever the defaults were. I think it was like an eight ounce cup of coffee, even though with this coffee maker, I could have uh, like iced coffee and, and three different sizes and I could do tea and, um, I mean, I, I looked at the uh, at the manual and it was like, oh, if only I could access that digital screen. Sometimes it comes down to all I want is a cup of coffee. And with the technology that we are building into appliances today, I can't even do that. I did since uh, then get a Keurig that does have buttons and I can um, I can use it very well. So I'm always looking for um, appliances and things that have buttons because they are much more user friendly. Uh, but again, it comes back to design. When we are designing these things, those of us with disabilities, access accessibility, inclusion shouldn't be an afterthought. I would think that everybody would really love it if they could just stand there and tap the screen and have the screen read out to them without having to, to look at it. So my name is Karen McCall. You can contact me at K4, the number four, McCall, M-C-C-A-L-L, at outlook.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at Carlin Info. And I do have some um, online courses and there are a lot of free things in terms of document accessibility on the carlincommunications.com website. And that's K-A-R-L-E-N communications with an S dot com. And I'll hand it over to you, Rev. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can also put questions in the chat for Karen. And Rev, if, if there are any questions, if you could read them out for me, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. So Walid um, says thanks. We have someone typing. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if I yes, can go, have a go, question. Yeah, yes, go ahead, Walid. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I have a question related to using of new technologies, for example, related to AI technology to convert uh, text to speech or something like this, if there is some uh, 
uh, already solution running, if it can be helpful. And also I want to know about the awareness procedures that all the society must do uh, towards enabling all the people to have the right uh, situation in learning and in work. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, thank you for sharing this uh, valuable information. Well, you're welcome. Um, narrator that comes with Office, or sorry, Windows, is a really good place to start. And if you look at um, uh, Microsoft Office applications, they do have a read aloud tool that will read the document. Um, a lot of people with learning uh, cognitive or other print disabilities in education will use a tool called Read and Write by Text Help. Um, that is licensed through the academic institution, but you can buy um, you can buy a, a copy of it. Uh, I know Google devices. Uh, there is a text to speech tool that is a, an extension. I think it's called Google Suite, and Firefox also has some extensions that have uh, text to speech in them. Uh, if you're using an iOS portable device, you have the voiceover tool, which is found under the accessibility settings. Now, when you're using these types of tools on mobile devices, they act a little bit differently than they do on desktop computers. So just have a little bit of patience. There is on uh, the Apple Store, there is a whole uh, learning module on how to use voiceover. Um, those devices uh, and operating systems also have screen magnification tools that you can use as well as um, dictation tools. For learning about awareness, um, if you go to carlincommunications.com and go to, I'm just trying to think of the web page, I do have a um, brochure, well, a, a book that I wrote for doing customer service training here in Ontario, and it's disability awareness training. And I run through a lot of scenarios and get you thinking about how would you buy things in a grocery store if you can't see them? How are you going to how are you going to find this item? How are you going to find that item? What about being at a conference in front of a buffet? How are you going to figure out what's in front of you? Um, I actually get some of my students to work through one of the scenarios so that they can start thinking differently and think in terms of um, document accessibility. If I can't see the document, how am I going to find the topic that I want? So uh, if you look, um, there are a lot of uh, customer service training modules that are free um, related to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. This um, document that I have is also free. If you can't find it on my website, just email me and I will send you uh, an accessible PDF copy of it. But it, it, it's designed to get you to start thinking so that when you're developing something, when you're designing something, you're looking at it and saying, um, how is somebody not, uh, going to be able to use this if they, if they can't see it, if they can't touch it? Um, just to get you thinking differently. Yes, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Karen. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. I guess that's it. I don't think anyone has any questions. Okay, well, if anybody thinks of any questions after uh, this session, please, uh, please email me. I'm always eager to answer questions. And I've put um, Karen's email address in the chats. If it's Karen, uh, so sorry, it's K4MCMcCall at Outlook.com. Is that correct, Karen? Yes, K4MCCALL at Outlook.com.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Karen. It was such a great session and thank you everyone for joining in. Um, this session is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the next 48 hours. <clears throat> All our links are on the screen so you can follow us on Meetup, follow us on Twitter, our YouTube channel and please subscribe to our email address to know about all our upcoming events. Um, we will be having some more topics in the accessibility series coming up in January and we'll keep you posted. Um, thank you very um, thank you very much, everyone. And Karen, uh, Joyce just Joyce says great presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Have a have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.